Hello and welcome to today's session. Today uh, we are looking at one of the texts by John Dryden, Preface to the Fables, which includes translations of Ovid and Chaucer. And in the previous session we had discussed how Dryden has been seen as the father of English literary criticism and how he made it possible for the English literary critical tradition to have a standalone status and how he even went to the extent of comparing the English critical tradition far superior than the classical tradition itself. Uh, and that if you remember he was the one who remarked that if Aristotle had seen our uh, plays, our dramas, then he would have perhaps changed his opinion about mix and tragedy and comedy. That said, it's important to remember at this point that this uh, work, Preface to the Fables, published in 1700, this was also incidentally one of the uh, final texts, one of the last texts that Dryden has written and published. So in the, that sense, this also has uh, significance in terms of being his uh, uh, last composition. Dryden, as you remember, he was also known as the prefatory man. He had written extensive prefaces uh, to all his works and those works have now come to uh, be seen as a body of literary criticism that Dryden has uh, written. So in this work we uh, realize that in the preface to the fables Dryden has translated the knight's tale, the nun's uh, priest's tale, the wife of Bath's tale, the flower and the leaf which was then uh, thought to be as Chaucer's but there is uh, still some debate about that and uh, he had also uh, given an extensive commentary on his opinion on his uh, take, his critical take on Chaucer and he was the one who had instantly referred to uh, Chaucer's work as here is God's plenty and this work is also seen as one of the earliest instances of uh, comparative criticism especially within English literary critical tradition and as the title also suggests he had attempted to compare Chaucer's works with that of uh, Ovid's. So there is a very direct kind of comparison between the classical uh, uh, literary tradition and eventually he without being overtly direct about his uh, preferences he does a very comparative uh, kind of uh, an analysis and he showcases some of the merits and demerits of both kinds of writings and eventually we also get the sense that Dryden seems to be upholding the English literary uh, tradition and also uh, trying to tell us how distinctive uh, Ch Chaucer and the subsequent uh, literary writings have been in uh, uh, within the English uh, literary field. So the preface is uh, divided into different sections and there are subtitles too. Uh, the, he begins by talking about the comparison between Chaucer and uh, Ovid. So I proceed to Ovid and Chaucer considering the former only in relation to the latter with Ovid entered the golden age of the Roman tongue from Chaucer the purity of English tongue began. Yeah. So he is looking at Ovid as a culmination of classical tradition. It, it, it was the work which also marked the end of the golden age of the Roman tongue and with Chaucer in whom he finds an almost similar kind of literary distinction. He identifies Chaucer as the starting point of a new tradition in English. So there is a marked difference over here in this comparison while Ovid is seen as a culmination of a certain tradition. Chaucer who has equal uh, literary and critical faculties, literary and critical uh, capacities, he is seen as the inaugurator of a certain tradition and we all know that now when we look at the English law, literary tradition, Chaucer is seen as the starting point, the proper starting point in various ways. Of course, there are Beowulf and other works uh, which uh, are also anonymously written but other than that, there is a proper way in which literary tradition begins, inaugurates with uh, Chaucer. So Dryden also had played a significant role in cementing this uh, notion about, uh, cementing this uh, idea about uh, literature and uh, literary history. And uh, Right at the outset, he begins to undertake this comparison between their manners. The manners of the poets were not unlike. Both of them were well-bred, well-natured, amorous and libertine, at least in their writings. It may be also in their lives. Their studies were the same, philosophy and philology. Both of them were knowing in astronomy, of which Ovid's book, uh, Books of the Roman Feasts and Chaucer's Treaties of the Astrolab are sufficient witnesses. But Chaucer was likewise an astrologer, as were Virgil, Horace, Perseus and Manilius. Both writ with wonderful facility and clearness, neither were great inventors. For Ovid only copied the Grecian fables, and most of Chaucer's stories were taken from his Italian contemporaries or their predecessors. Uh, Boccaccio's his Decameron was first published, and from thence our Englishman has borrowed many of his Canterbury tales. Yet, that of Palamon and Archite was written in all probability by some Italian wit in a former age, as I shall prove hereafter. The tale of Grizzled was the invention of Petrarch by him sent to Boccaccio, 
from whom it came to Chaucer. Troilus and Cressida was also written by a Lombard author, but much amplified by our English translator, as well as beautified, the genius of our countrymen in general being rather to improve an invention than to invent themselves, as it evident not only in our poetry, but in many of our manufacturers. So he is being critical as well as lavish in his praise of his own countrymen. He is being very balanced over here as well. He uh, admits it very directly whenever he finds that certain texts, certain narratives have been borrowed and he is also um, very balanced in his approach in situating Chaucer as well as other contemporaries of his times. He also talks about the nature of his own writing. He's not the kind who is found overtly looking for any kind of praise of his own works. In fact, he has a confidence to even write that. The nature of a preface is rambling, never wholly out of the way nor in it. This I've learned from the practice of Honest Montaigne, who's considered as a father of essay writing, and return at my pleasure to Ovid and Chaucer, of whom I have a little more to say. So he talks about the kind of digression that his own writing uh, makes when he's writing a preface and by this time he's towards the end of his career, end of his life and he's also uh, garnered enough confidence to be critical, to be satirical, to be sarcastic about his own writings and the nature in which they have been organized together. So uh, after having pointed out the various ways in which English literary uh, men have borrowed from other uh, writers, other European writers. He now goes on to make a very uh, pertinent point. Since Chaucer had something of his own, the wife of Bath's tale, the cock and the fox, which I have translated and some others, I may justly give our countryman the precedence in that part. So he is attributing a sense of originality in this comparative analysis right at the outset. He says most great literary men of those times, and obviously we are not referring to any of the uh, women in uh, any of these uh, writings. So most literary men of those times, they had borrowed from different traditions and that is certainly not seen as a flaw, that is not seen as a setback, but nevertheless that is being seen as a very appropriate thing in order to position Chaucer as someone with at least a little bit of originality. He had something of his own and he also says this very categorically, I can remember nothing of Ovid which was wholly his. So the yardsticks are already set. So the first point being originality in this comparative analysis, the first yardstick that uh, uh, Dryden has in mind is originality, that Chaucer was far more original than Ovid ever was. Both of them understood the manners under which name I comprehend the passions and in a larger sense the descriptions of persons and their very habits. For an example, I see Bosius and uh, Philemon as perfectly before me as if some ancient painter had drawn them and the pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales, their humours, their features and the very dress as distinctly as if I had supped with them at the Tabard uh, in Southwark. So this is the kind of graphic quality that both Ovid Owitz's writings as well as Chaucer's writings had. He uh, uh, he says, you know, it, it feels as if he had dined with those uh, pilgrims at the uh, Southwark Inn. Yet even there too, the figures of Chaucer are much more lively and set in a better light, which though I have not time to prove, yet I appeal to the reader, I'm sure he will clear me from partiality. So he's very much aware that he his observations will be seen as biased that his observations will be seen as partial towards his own, which is uh, uh, Chaucer. But nevertheless, he has a confidence to reiterate that even if you do an analysis, you will see that Chaucer's characters are definitely brighter, more graphically drawn, and certainly his narrative was very original. So having established this level of superiority that Chaucer has over Ovid, uh, Ovid is also one of the greatest masters of the classical tradition. So having established this superiority at an individual level between uh, Ovid and Chaucer, he is also elevating this to a larger uh, uh, to, to a larger uh, scheme of things where the English literary critical tradition, where the English literary tradition itself becomes superior to the classical literary writings. He now moves on to the styles of Ovid, uh, styles of Chaucer and Ovid again in a very comparative sense and as you have noticed in the first uh, uh, section, the comparison always leads to a certain kind of judgment as well. He does a very balanced comparison where he discusses the merits and demerits of both the writers. And then he gives his own judgment about who he thinks is better than the uh, other, other one. The thoughts and words remain to be considered in the comparison of two poets. I have saved myself one half of that labour by owning that Ovid lived when the Roman tongue was in its meridian. 
Chaucer in the dawning of her language. Therefore, that part of the comparison stands not on an equal foot any more than the diction of Aeneas and Ovid or of Chaucer and our present English. So, if you are uh, familiar with Chaucer's writings, his Canterbury Tales, you would know that the language is very distant from us. It feels like it's almost like a foreign tongue for us. English language was still in uh, the stage of infancy. It had uh, yet to evolve into something more refined. The spellings were different. The vocabulary was different. It, uh, as we mentioned, looks almost like a distant foreign tongue. So, Ovid was writing during a time when uh, Roman tongue had already reached its perfection, just like uh, their literature and culture, or culture also had. But it had culminated and then it had begun to descent as well. It uh, was almost the end of the glorious period of uh, Roman literature. But when um, Chaucer was writing, language had not yet, uh, language was not yet fully formed. So, this needs to be taken into account. This needs to be factored in when we are trying to compare their literary styles, their language. The, so, says uh, uh, Dryden. So, in some sense, if somebody finds that Ovid's literary style was far more superior to that of Chaucer, he says that's also a very imbalanced way of looking at things. And uh, he goes on to give these examples from both of them, from Ovid as well as Chaucer, in their ability to uh, invoke different kinds of uh, emotions. On these occasions, the poet should uh, endeavor to raise pity, but instead of this, Ovid is tickling you to laugh. Virgil never made use of such machines when he was moving you to commiserate the death of Dido. He would not destroy what he was building. Chaucer makes Asset violent in his love and unjust in the pursuit of it. Yet when he came to die, he made him think more reasonably. He repents not of his love, for that had altered his character, but acknowledges the injustice of his proceedings and resigns Emilia to Parliament. What would Ovid have done on this occasion? He would certainly have made our sight witty on his deathbed. He had complained he was further off from possession by being so near and a thousand such boysomes which Chaucer rejected as below the dignity of the subject. They who think otherwise would, by the same reason, prefer Lucan to an Ovid to Homer and Virgil and Marshall to all four of them. So, he is making a more extensive kind of comparison over here in order to prove that it was not just about the language, but also about the emotions which were invoked by a certain stylistic presentation of language. Here, he uh, gives certain context from uh, the classical uh, literary tradition and he tells us about how certain emotions were invoked by a particular use of language and how uh, Chaucer would not have done some of those things. For instance, you know, invo invoking laughter even at the face of death, Chaucer would not have done that because that was below the dignity of the subject. So, there is again a sense of superiority which is attributed to Chaucer and his style of writing. And the other important thing that he uh, highlights in the next passage is about the simplicity that Chaucer had. Chaucer writ with more simplicity and followed nature more closely than to use them. I have thus far, to the best of my knowledge, been an upright judge between the parties in competition, not meddling with the design nor the disposition of it, because the design was not their own, and the disposing of it and in the disposing of it, they were equal. It remains that I say somewhat of Chaucer in particular. So, he himself is aware of the bias which could be identified in this comparative analysis that this is heavily tilted towards identifying Chaucer as a superior writer, as a superior uh, narrator and a superior uh, master in terms of his use of language, not just in terms of language per se, but in terms of using language to invoke, to evoke particular kinds of emotions. And now he moves on to, from this comparative analysis, he moves on to focus on Chaucer in particular and this is a very definitive move. This is a very significant move in the tradition of English uh, uh, literary criticism because this is also one of the earliest and finest uh, critical uh, observation available on Chaucer's works. And on this, we can say that much of uh, the uh, literary reputation of uh, Chaucer also rests, just the way we will find later on how Johnson's profess had uh, uh, given a lot of mileage to Shakespeare's works to cement his literary reputation. In the same way, we will find that Chaucer's literary reputation gained a lot of mileage through this preface written by Dryden and uh, more so because Dryden had this uh, uh, status, literary status during his time, during the neoclassical time and whatever he said did leave a mark on the uh, literary and critical tradition of England. So, here he moves a bit away from his comparison between Chaucer and Ovid and 
here while situating Chaucer as a father of English poetry, he compares him with Homer. Yeah, this is how uh, this passage begins. In the first place, as he is the father of English poetry, so I hold him in the same degree of veneration as the Grecians held Homer or the Romans Virgil. He is a perpetual fountain of good sense. These are some of the oft quoted lines on Ch uh, Chaucer and his uh, work. Learned in all sciences and therefore speaks properly on all subjects. As he knew what to say, so he knows also when to leave off a continence which is practiced by few writers and scarcely by any of the ancients, excepting Virgil and Horace. So there is a very marked, very visible way in which Chaucer is always elevated over the others who were always considered uh, excellent in terms of their uh, classical uh, position. One of our late great poets is sunk in his reputation because he could never forgive any conceit which came in his way but swept like a dragnet, great and small. There was plenty enough but the dishes were ill sorted. Whole pyramids of sweet meats for boys and women but little solid meat for men. So these are the comparisons that he makes in order to make criticism palatable for the common readers as well. All this proceeded not from any want of knowledge but of judgment. Neither did he want in discerning the beauties and faults of other poets but only indulged himself in the luxury of writing and perhaps knew it was a fault but hoped the reader would not find it. So these many comparisons from contemporary writers as well as from uh, classical writers are brought in in order to further cement the reputation of uh, Chaucer. And in this process Dryden is very much aware that Chaucer's work perhaps is not perfect due to various reasons, due to the limitations of language, due to the limitations of content, due to the limitations of uh, the work itself, Canterbury Tales itself being an incomplete tale in certain sense. So this is how he, he ends this section. There is a rude sweetness of a Scotch tune in it, which is natural and pleasing, though not perfect. And this also ties up very well with one of the important functions of literature to please and uh, this has been reiterated by various critics from the time of uh, uh, Sydney onwards about the ability of the writer to please over even to instruct and to persuade and how in the latent romantic tradition we would also know that this ability to please through imagination is it, it eventually becomes the most superior kind of faculty attribute to any kind of artistic production as well. So coming back to this text uh, there is a way in which now um, Dryden begins to locate some flaws, some very, very significant limitations that Chaucer's work had and this is being uh, situated in uh, different ways. He first talks about the writing, he also talks about the political affiliations and also the religious opinions that Chaucer had. So it's a, a three-dimensional way of uh, uh, looking at Chaucer's life and Chaucer's writings uh, almost together. So here we find Dryden though inadvertently employing different modes of criticism. He is looking at the text, he is also looking at the socio-political conditions, he is also looking, he's, uh, in the same vein looking at the um, work in the context of the biography of the writer. So there is historical criticism, biographical criticism and a purely textual criticism which is at work over here though very very inadvertently. So the methods and the techniques would come across is very raw but given that this was written in the 17 uh, uh, but given that this was written in 1700 and that such techniques were still in its uh, infant uh, stage we find this a very very remarkable uh, achievement a very remarkable kind of a milestone in terms of uh, the English literary critical tradition. So first of all Dryden finds uh, Chaucer's meter defective and he says maybe uh, we could also forgive him for that because language was still evolving and it could be uh, because of such limitations as well. It were an easy matter to produce some thousands of his verses which are lame for want of half a foot and sometimes a whole one and which no pronunciation can make otherwise. We can only say that he lived in the infancy of our poetry and that is very very important to notice. In spite of language uh, literature, culture, everything being in a very infant state and even political England was not really well formed during the time was, uh, when Chaucer was writing. There were a lot of things happening during his lifetime and England was still uh, engaging with wars and there was famine and uh, um, amidst this distress uh, Chaucer continued to write. So one needs to make allowance for whatever kind of faults or limitations that one could find in his poetry. So uh, as Dryden would say, he lived in the infancy of our poetry and that nothing is brought to perfection at the first. We must 
be children before we grow men. So that's how he sees it. Chaucer is by far the best, but we also need to admit that he was also working within the limitations of all these circumstances within which he was placed. And given that, there is also this uh, 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 critique about Dryden's critique on uh, Chaucer that Dryden also perhaps did not really understand Dryden also perhaps uh, did not really understand the depth of Chaucer's works and he also was uh, caught up in these stylistic limitations and in these linguistic limitations. Yeah. So we uh, will not go into the details of those. Now we will move on to the other point that uh, Dryden makes about Chaucer's political connections. Chaucer was one of those rare writers who had the good fortune or the misfortune to live and write under three different monarchs. So I need to say little of his parentage, life and fortunes. They are to be found at large in all the editions of his works. So this also tells us that during the time when Dryden was writing, a lot of biographical information was always already available on Chaucer. So he does not uh, repeat those things, but he focuses on one point that he finds extremely interesting. He was employed abroad and favored by Edward III, Richard II and Henry IV. So Chaucer lived and wrote under three different monarchs and this had also influenced the varied quality, had determined the varied quality of Chaucer's writings. And it also tells us how uh, Chaucer also had to be very diplomatic in his articulations in order to not to get into any kind of uh, uh, political controversies. And uh, Trident says he was poet, I suppose, to all three of them. In Richard's time, I doubt he was a little dipped in the rebellion of the commons and being brother-in-law to John of Gaunt, he, it was no wonder if he had followed the fortunes of that family and was well with, the Henry, well with Henry IV when he deposed his predecessor. Neither is it to be admired that Henry, who was a wise as well as a valiant prince, who claimed by succession and was sensible that his title was not sound but was rightfully in Mortimer, who had married the heir of York, it was not to be admired, I say, if that great politician should be pleased to have the greatest wit of those times in his interest and to be the trumpet of his praises. Augustus had given him the example by the advice of Messenius, who recommended Virgil and Horace to him, whose praises helped to make him popular while he was alive and after his death have made him precious to posterity. So this is the kind of accolade that Dryden gives to Chaucer for having lived and written successfully through these uh, different regimes and they were all radically different from each other. One even, you know, killed the other to uh, claim the throne. So that's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of history through which uh, Chaucer was living. And through this very turbulent history, it's very interesting, it's very uh, commendable that Chaucer could produce such excellent verse, which even earned him the title of being the first uh, proper English literary writer. While uh, Dryden is being uh, very uh, sympathetic and quite uh, uh, in, in adulation about the uh, political life that Chaucer had, rather the apolitical di life that he led, during these turbulent times, he seems to be a bit critical of uh, Chaucer's uh, uh, religious opinions. And uh, Chaucer was very critical of uh, the clergy of his times and uh, Dryden does not entirely appreciate that attitude which was critical in uh, uh, Chaucer. I cannot blame him for inveighing so sharply against the vices of the clergy of his age, their pride, their ambition, their pomp, their avarice, their worldly interest deserved the lashes which he gave them both in that and in most of his Canterbury tales. Neither has his contemporary Bocash spared them. Yet, but both those poets lived in much esteem with good and holy men in orders. For the scandal which is given by a particular priest reflects not on the sacred function. Chaucer's monk, his Shannon and his friar took not from the character of his good parson. A satirical poet is the check of the layman on bad priests. I have followed Chaucer in his character of a holy man and have enlarged on that subject with some pleasure, reserving myself to the right, if I shall think fit hereafter to describe another sort of priest, such as are more easily to be found than the good parson, such as have given the last blow to Christianity in this age by a practice so contrary to their doctrine, but this will keep cold till another time. In the meanwhile, I take up Chaucer where I left him. So there are certain things that Dryden perhaps do not agree with, but he does not want to take these uh, uh, take take this discussion upon uh, himself at this point of time. And then he moves on to tell us something uh, 
extremely powerful about Chaucer's work, which also has uh, cemented Chaucer's reputation almost forever within the uh, uh, literary tradition. Here is God's Plenty, and this is perhaps the greatest tribute that Dryden uh, is paying to Chaucer. He must have been a man of a most wonderful comprehensive nature because as it has been truly observed of him, he has taken into the compass of his Canterbury Tales the various manners and humours of the whole English nation in his age. Not a single character has escaped him. As you can see, this is a stellar tribute that uh, Dryden is giving to Chaucer's works. All his pilgrims are severely distinguished from each other and not only in their inclinations but in their very physiognomies and persons. Yeah, so this is the one of the observations which has always stood uh, Chaucer's work uh, works in good stead and about him being very representative of his age in spite of staying apolitical to a very large extent in spite of uh, uh, having uh, had to live through diplomatically under three different monarchs and we also find that in between he even had to uh, change his uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, writerly affiliations because of the kind of uh, uh, difficulties that he began to face in terms of uh, uh, finances. So that said, we continue to focus on Dryden's observation. It is sufficient to say, according to the proverb, that here is God's plenty. We have our forefathers and great grand dames all before us, as they were in Chaucer's days. Their general characters are still remaining in mankind, and that is perhaps. Uh, a really a wonderful thing to say about Chaucer's characters that they were true representations of Chaucer's times and we still find their remnants, we still find the vestiges of those types even during uh, con the contemporary Dryden says even during his own times. And this is in spite of the realization that um, Dryden notes towards the end of this passage for mankind is ever the same and nothing lost out of nature though everything is altered. So in spite of this peculiar nature about human nature, we find that Chaucer had managed to do his best in order to graphically represent his characters in the truest way that he could stay to his times. In the following section, Dryden is uh, trying to give us a rationale for omitting a couple of uh, translations and he says towards the end, for that reason such tales shall be left untold uh, by me. So there is a certain kind of bodiness in Chaucer's uh, uh, writing, especially in some of his tales, which became quite unpalatable to the English audience uh, during the neoclassical time. So we find Dryden, for that reason, leaving out some of the uh, some of the uh, aspects from this work. And he says, if anything of this nature or of profaneness be crept into these poems, I am so far from defending it that I disown it. Chaucer makes another manner of apology for his broad speaking. But I will follow neither of them. Our countryman, in the end of his characters, before the Canterbury Tales, thus excuses the, the ribaldry, which is very gross in many of his novels. So he distances himself from the bodiness and the uh, licentiousness of Chaucer's writings, and he says, These tales shall be left untold by me. There is a sense of judgmentality over here. There is a way in which the moral conditioning of those times begin to influence the way in which uh, Dryden attempts to translate uh, uh, Chaucer. But uh, nevertheless, we find that the response is very, very balanced too. And the reason for this and the rationale for this choice he gives at the beginning of uh, this passage, if I had desired more to please than to instruct. Yeah? So here, the priorities of neoclassical literary tradition exemplified in Dryden's uh, works and Dryden's translations and his prefaces. It's very, very clear over here that his priority, his most important objective is to instruct and not to please. And he also says, I will no more offend against good manners. I am sensible as I ought to be of the scandal I have given by my loose writings and make what reparation I am able by this public acknowledgement. So he is trying to distance himself from any kind of controversy that might uh, ensue out of uh, the translation of any of the licentious verses or the body verses from Chaucer's writings and he also tries to rationalize this, tries to legitimize this in the name of the accountability that he thinks he holds towards the society. And we also need to keep in mind that Dryden writes this towards the end of his career, towards the end of his uh, uh, lifetime and there is also a uh, certain rigidity perhaps which has crept in into his uh, uh, vision of the world and that must have also conditioned the pace in which he look at morality and immorality and also about what kind of uh, uh, writings could be made available for uh, public consumption.
the following section where he talks about Chaucer's language and the need for translation. And uh, here he minces no words while he is trying to point out that Chaucer's language is certainly obsolete and that unless this is translated into a proper kind of uh, English, this cannot be understood at all. So, a lot of uh, later critics have found this very problematic because they feel that Dryden perhaps did not know how to decipher Chaucer's language well, that he did not know how to be appreciative of the qualities of Old English uh, uh, writings. But here also what is very remarkable is the, is the balanced attitude uh, with which he presents this. I dare not advance my opinion against the judgment of so great an author, but I think it fair, however, to leave the decision to the public. Mr. Cawley was too modest to set up for a dictator and being shocked perhaps was his old style, never examined into the depth of his good sense. So, he talks about the need to present these works in contemporary English. He is also aware that many people were unhappy about it. I find some people are offended that I have turned these tales into modern English because they think them unworthy of my pains and look on Chaucer as a dry, old-fashioned wit not worth receiving. So, this is the context in which we need to look at the criticisms that Dryden presents against Chaucer. That was also the time when Chaucer perhaps did not receive the kind of literary uh, merit, the kind of literary uh, accolades that he uh, really well deserved. So, it is important for uh, Dryden to maintain a critical distance for the reading public to take him seriously enough, to take his judgment seriously enough, wherein he is also undertaking this laborious task of making Chaucer relevant to the modern public, uh, Chaucer relevant to the uh, 17th as well as 18th centuries. And if someone is suspicious about the kind of admiration that Dryden has for Chaucer, he spells this out, he spells this out very clearly. In sum, I seriously protest that no man ever had or can have a greater veneration for Chaucer than myself. I have translated some part of his works only that I might perpetuate his memory or at least refresh it amongst my countrymen. If I have altered him anywhere for the better, I must at the same time acknowledge that I could have done nothing without him. I am not so vain to think I deserved a greater. So, this is again a marvelous way in which Dryden tries to tell uh, his contemporaries as well as his posterity that he couldn't have perhaps wished for a better kind of a beginning, a better kind of a kind of an ancestor, a better person as the father of English poetry. And Dryden, who's been rightly given the title of uh, being the uh, father of English literary criticism, he takes this onus upon himself to represent Chaucer to his contemporary audience and as he himself says to perpetuate his memory or at least refresh it uh, amongst my countrymen. This is also a way in which he uh, brings back to memory, he reinstates not just Chaucer but an entire literary critical tradition that followed from the time of Chaucer. And, uh, and he is also re reminding his audience, reminding his readers about another translation which is uh, also uh, at work during this time, at this time translating Chaucer into modern French. And uh, he also in this sense is underscoring the kind of relevance that Chaucer has not just on the English critical tradition but on the European tradition itself. The fame and memory of great wits should be renewed as Chaucer is both in France and England. If this be holy chance, it is extraordinary and I dare not call it more for fear of being taxed with superstition. And this bringing together of France and England over here is extremely important because for the longest time as we know the political as well as territorial rivalry between um, France and uh, England was quite legendary. It had led to a number of wars including the Hundred Years War and that was also one of the things which had continually weighed down on both England as well as France. So, this coming together and also the linguistic rivalry was also quite infamous to such an extent that for 200 years as we know English language was completely overshadowed by, by uh, French and English actually had to make a comeback after almost two centuries of uh, obsolation. So, in this context making uh, Chaucer to bridge this gap, the linguistic gap, the literary gap, the cultural gap and so at this point to bring in Chaucer to bridge these gaps between the two nations is extremely important. It also tells us about the transnational capacity of uh, 
writers such as uh, Chaucer and how translations and also these sort of critical evaluations would help us in cross-cultural uh, uh, transactions. Dryden seeks to wrap up his discussion with a comparison of uh, Chaucer and Boccaccio and also by focusing on the wife of Bath's tale and the knight's tale. And in these final sections to the details of which we shall not be going into, uh, we find that the partiality, that, uh, that that's how uh, Dryden himself refers to his attitude, the partiality shown towards Chaucer is quite evident over here. But uh, the, the rationale that he gives for it, the literary rationale that he gives for it is also very evident. And if you look at the ending of this uh, preface, he had begun with a comparative note comparing Chaucer and Ovid. He had begun with a comparison between classical tradition as well as English tradition. But towards the end, we find that he focuses entirely on uh, Chaucer and on his particular kinds of uh, works. He also tells us about how he had to circumvent his way around uh, these two tales, Wife of Bath's Tale and The Knight's Tale, in, uh, due to its uh, licentious nature. But that does not take away the appreciation or the kind of uh, uh, literary critical value that uh, uh, Dryden places upon Chaucer and his works. And this is how he ends this uh, preface. Chaucer is now become an original and I question not but the poem has received many beauties by passing through his noble hands and he is in the process of giving what is due to the various translations and the various editions that went before him. He is taking this occasion to reiterate that Chaucer is by far the original and also this is seen as perhaps the most important reason to identify Chaucer as the starting point of this literary critical tradition and also for, uh, for placing him far above the classical tradition. And this is how the, uh, the final line uh, goes. Besides this tale, there is another of his own in, uh, invention after the manner of the proven calls called the flower and the leaf with which I was so particularly pleased both for the invention and the moral that I cannot hinder myself from recommending it to the reader. Not only does he further cement the reputation of uh, uh, Canterbury Tales, he is also recommending a new work for uh, highlighting its visibility, highlighting its, its critical quality to the contemporary readers. So this is how the uh, contributions of Chaucer were evaluated in 1700 by Dryden and we also realize how that had contributed directly to the emergence of comparative criticism and also for identifying English literary crit critical tradition as a standalone critical tradition. Thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you in the next session.